Welcome to Bellingham Voices. I'm your host, Deb Slater. Well, she's a general manager, a traveler, an adventurer, a mother, a community leader. Some even call her Mama J. She's Janet Leitner, and she joins us today for Bellingham Voices. Thanks for being here, Janet. That's my pleasure. Thanks, Deb. So, Obviously, many people know you for your connection with Boundary Bay Brewery, a mm. Bellingham institution, but, and we'll get to that in, mm. a, in a little bit. But let's get to know you first. Where were you born? Where'd you grow up? I grew up in um, Spokane, Washington, 2507 West Rosewood. <laughs> um, my parents still live in the house that I grew up in. And um, so when I go home, I really, truly go home. I lived there since I, I mean, it's the only house I can remember. I think I was probably six months old when we moved in. And um, so it's just, it's just such an honor to ha be able to, to still go home to, to my house and see my parents. I feel very fortunate that my folks are still, still alive and independent living. And it's just, it's so great. I That's talk amazing. To them, yeah, talk to them many times a week and try to see them at least once every six to eight weeks I try to get to Spokane. Head over the pass. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So then what brought you to Bellingham? Well, I went to, I graduated high school in Spokane and I immediately went to Seattle. Um, Spokane felt a little small, a little too conservative at the time. I had visited Seattle with some high school friends and a counselor, got to see a glimpse of the big city and I was intrigued about the culture and that whole vibrancy. So I went to Seattle and I went to community college for a year, and we had friends that were going up to Western for school. And um, every time we'd go up to Western or to Bellingham, it would be sunny. The weather would be nicer. <laughs> and I was like, why did we move to Seattle when it's so much nicer in Bellingham? <laughs> Which is silly because the weather is very similar, but um, it was just serendipi serendipitous that when we would come and visit. And that and the vibe of Bellingham really, um, really struck me at the time. It had, um, you know, lack of a better word, it had kind of a hippie vibe and, you know, that feeling. And so I was definitely drawn to the, the artistic side of Bellingham and just the, the liberal arts up at the school. And so that's what really brought me here was the weather. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Not very many people say that. No, that's true. That's true. So you went to Western. Yes. And then, and then after Western, what was your first career? What, where did I, you work? Well, back to my roots in Spokane, my mom grew up on a farm. And so there was a lot of farming in my childhood and in my young adult life. And so learning to grow food translated to me in how to preserve food and how to cook food. Mm. So that's, I was always really drawn to kitchen work and, and so that's what I did. I found fun, fun, creative kitchens to work in and um, began to create a career path that eventually turned into being chef. And your chef experience, you have some all-star places. If, if anyone, you know, old school Bellingham, you will know some of the places that you worked in. Name some of them for us. Well, um, the Cliff House was an experience that I had working for GTM, big corporation yep. back in the day here. And then I moved to um, down to Fairhaven where um, Chef Peter Cady had come from New England where there was a culinary academy that he taught in. And so he opened uh, the Cobblestone Cafe down mm. in Fairhaven. And I really learned a lot from Chef Cady. He was, um, he was a teacher. And um, so I worked for Chef Cady. I worked at um, Wild Garlic from there. Uh, and then from Wild Garlic, I went on to Il Fiasco. And I was not chef at El Fiasco, but some nights I did, I was in charge of the kitchen and I learned a lot from Chef Brian Jones there. And um, yeah, so then, and then at that, after that, then I moved on to, to Boundary. But that was kind of, you know, getting my chops in some fine dining in Bellingham and it was, that was a great experience. Yeah, because those were, those were the fine dining yeah. establishments. Yeah at the time. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people are like, I, I, there's still so much fondness when people mention Il Fiasco mm -hmm. or Wild wild Garlic. Yeah. It's like, and I remember those places too. It's just yeah. such such a great, you know, being part of that, I'm sure it's really great for you to reminisce sure. about those places. Yeah. Still cook some of the dishes that I learned to yeah. cook in those places. Yeah. 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 So then enter Boundary Bay. Right. The, the, the year was 96? 97 I joined. Okay. We, um, 
Ed opened the brewery in 95, and some of my, my kitchen mates and um, servers from those other restaurants that I just mentioned uh, were intrigued by this concept of a brew pub coming to Bellingham. So they were all like, let's go, let's go, let's, um, the cobblestone was closing down and, and they, so we're like, you know, where are we going to go next? So um, went over to Boundary and chatted with Ed, who's now my husband, we, um, and his concept for the restaurant at that time was a little bit, he was, he'd come from wine country. So his concept for the brew pub at first resembled something more of like a, a large tasting room in Napa where you go wine tasting. Oh, yeah. Some small, simple snacks, good food, but not a full-on menu. So the opening, that was his concept in opening, and the kitchen was very small, and I still had uh, some burning passion, you know, for this fine dining thing that I wanted to keep doing. So I kept on that path, and then about... A year and a half after he opened, then in '97, I I did join. Okay. My um, my friends were calling and and so at one point in time, I was actually running from Il Fiasco in my chef clothes <laughs> over to Boundary, <laughs> and I think about this like people up in their apartments watching this woman run across <laughs> downtown Bellingham from restaurant to restaurant. So that lasted a little while, getting Il Fiasco through a busy season, and then coming into, into Boundary full-time and really then just watching the, the restaurant grow and adding to the menu and just people were so, um, so excited to have a brew pub in Bellingham. It was yeah. so new and I mean it took, a, it took a while but by 97, 98 to, to, into the 2000s it yeah. was just like whoa, yeah. couldn't keep up. So yeah. as a chef you were a big proponent of farm to table before farm to table yeah. was even a thing, yeah. right? Yes, and I, that, that harken back to your roots. Yes, yeah, yeah, and even to this day, I mean, Cloud Mountain Farms. We use more produce from Cloud Mountain Farms than any other than any other store, restaurant, any entity in Bellingham. And I, when I found that out, that was just a couple years ago when Cheryl shared that with me. I was like. I was just taken aback because, I mean, you think of the co-op, right? Yeah. You know, our grocery stores, that, yeah. that's where the, but we go through more of their fruits and vegetables than anyone else. Yeah. And way back when, um, when Nettles Farm was happening over on Lummi Island, going over there and trying to get farmers to plant, you know, just rows of, you know, certain things in their gardens for us to use at Boundary. So it was very early on that that we we've worked with farmers, you know, since the time I got to about, got there. How does that make you feel? That's it's a, makes me proud. Yeah, yeah, it makes me really proud, and I love the connections. You know, I love knowing where where our food comes from. Um, we use um, Gothberg Farm cheese, then that goat cheese, and then be able to go down there and see the goats and you know know where that. It's just it's it. We in the kitchen talk about love going into the food and that you can actually feel it, taste it, experience it. When you eat something that someone's made with love, it is, you can tell. And so when those fruits and vegetables or cheese and the things that we use, they're curated by people that love the earth, the, the animals that things are coming from, I believe we can feel that too. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing that you kind of started was the beer pairings mm -hmm. at Boundary Bay. Yeah. Yeah, do, talk about that a little bit. Well, it was, it's interesting because Ed did come from wine country. Mm -hmm. And um, the wine industry did such a good job marketing that wine and food, wine and cheese, wine and grapes, wine and, you know, <laughs> red wine with this and white wine with that. But really, when you think about it, when you go out to dinner with your friends, what are you going to have with a burger? You're going to have beer, you know? What are you going to have with pizza? You're going to have beer, you know, this tacos, beer. I mean, just, you know, the things that we like to eat, the flavors that beer goes with food, and I think as well, and if not better, than wine. So I kind of took that, you know, kind of that little chip on my shoulder and went in, you know, trying to... And there were a group of us in the in the beer um, world early on that thought we were going to take this on. And it really, wine does a really good job contrasting flavors. So it does it does that very well. But what beer does is it 
it is more comparable. It's more complementing the flavors. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you think about the, you know, the way that beer is made from grains and bread is, you know, made from grain. And so it's this complementary rather than, you know, something that's so contrary that it's interesting to drink the wine and eat. But when you're drinking beer with food, it's just, it's just, it just flows more naturally to yeah. me. Yeah. 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 Great. So then you were chef at Boundary Bay. Mm -hmm. uh, when did you become general manager? Imagine early 2000s. It's about 2001, maybe. 2001. It was a very difficult transition. Um, I could almost like tear up thinking about it, but I, I, so, you know, you're, it's hard work. It's really hard work. And so my, my yes. Physical, and so my wrists, many, my wrists yeah. were starting to, to go. And, you know, I was ended up sauteing actually with my shoulder. I was being able to lift pans. So I was, it was becoming a health, a health issue. So we, um, we talked and the brewery was needing something like a general manager, somebody, we were growing all over the place. So we, that position was needed and I was, uh, had the skill set to do that, having grown with the brewery for that many years. So we talked about it and I hired in a kitchen manager and I went upstairs to an office and I became, I became depressed and I, and I couldn't figure it out. I was like, I'm, I don't go home smelling of food and I don't have any burns on my arms or hands and my wrists are healing up and my back is better. Why am I sad? Mm. What is going on? And I just really had to dig deep and I, and I was saying goodbye to someone. And that person was that girl in that chef outfit. And I had to actually do an exercise with myself and, and really, you know, did a visualization and I had to say goodbye. And it was, it was, it was. I can imagine. Yeah, yeah it was hard. Yeah. And I knew I needed to do that. And um, there was a time when I was still running into the kitchen in my street clothes and, then, and the staff in the kitchen is going like, what are you doing in here? And I'm like. <laughs> I know I'm not helping. I'm like, you know, and they're like, no, we got this. Yeah, so it was kind of a, you know, messy little world for a while. But I um, have really grown in myself and, you know, just learning to manage and human resources. And just it's been a great learning curve for me. But there was a time of, yeah. Some, Very difficult. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So as of July 2019, uh -huh. just recently, um, there are officially 12 official breweries in Bellingham city limits, but there's 16 in Whatcom County right. and another one might have opened like, right. You blinked yesterday. <laughs> um, now years ago, someone told me that you were happy when more breweries started opening mm -hmm. up the, the more the merrier type of thing. And I remember that really made an impression on me because if it were me <laughs> and I was the general manager of the big kid on the block, uh -huh. Boundary Bay Brewery, which is a Bellingham institution gathering place, right. iconic. You bring everyone there when mm -hmm. they come to visit. If that were me, I would be like, this is mine. <laughs> I own this. Right. So what were you thinking? You, you said that, right? Like bring it on. Yeah. Well, again, I mean, Cooking is so collaborative and the way that I went about it with working with farmers and you know, see do you have this collaborative spirit? And I always look to San Francisco as the model. And I would study restaurants in San Francisco and because they were they were producing new um, new flavors, new combinations of food. And it was just such a fascinating time in the you know, late 90s. And, mm. and San, what is San Francisco but a city full of restaurants? Yeah. When you go, you bring your second stomach. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, if, and if we, you know, so I thought, what, that makes that city fascinating. People go to that city for restaurants. They go there for the food scene. So why not come to Bellingham for the beer scene? More, more breweries are going to keep us accountable on the quality. And the, the Brewers Association at that time was really, um, really preaching quality, quality, quality. Uh, there were a lot of, well, 
1995, when Boundary Bay opened, there were 276 breweries in the country. Now there's nearly 500 in Washington wow. and over 7,000 in the country. Wow. So if these, weren't, if these breweries weren't producing quality, consistent quality, you know, craft beverages, they, that trend would not have happened. So the BA really drove that home in their, um, their educational materials, in seminars, and I thought, well, if we're all gonna be brewing beer here, it's gonna be good beer, and people are gonna come to Bellingham, and that's just, it's good for the, you don't just, if you go to, a, if you go to San Francisco, you're right, you bring your second stomach, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. So if you come to Bellingham, you better be packing some growlers yeah. to take home with you and have a cooler in your trunk, and you're not just going to go to one brewery. You're, we call it brewing ham. You're here. You're going to be traveling around. You're going to have your tap trail map out. You're going to be checking them all out. And so it's become a beer destination. And that's, um, that's so bring them on. And they're different sizes. And we complement each other in different styles. And some have food trucks. Some have full-on restaurants. Some have music. You know, you can you know, make a holiday out of Bellingham now just for the beer scene. Do you check out your competition? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. What do they say when you walk in? Because you are Boundary Bay incarnate. You are, you know, a personification of the iconic brewery in Bellingham. Yeah. I mean, they got to be like, Janet's here. Oh, my gosh, Janet's here. Right? I like to think I get a hug. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because so what, nice. what is it like in the industry in Bellingham? Is it, is it collaborative or is, is it competitive? What, what, it's all you, of that. It's yeah. all of that. Yeah. It's very, um, if someone needs yeast, Somebody, you know, your, if your yeast hasn't propagated, you need some yeast from somebody. Um, somebody will loan you some yeast. Um, equipment, grain, um, forklift. Um, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, like, the guys over at Gruff, they're just right across the street from us. Uh -huh. And um, so they'll come over and get our forklift. And, you know, it's, 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 so it's very... I love that. Yeah. It's, it's, but it's highly competitive. Yeah. We're all trying to make the best beer out there. And so, yeah, it's, it's competition. But if I hear that somebody won an award in Bellingham, I'll reach out and congratulate them as soon as, as, soon as I get the news, just because it makes you proud to be a part of that community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You said, too, that the competition keeps you relevant, and the competition mm -hmm. is something that, that created or, or created the desire to branch out. Like mm -hmm. you still do the Scotch Ale and mm -hmm. the, you know, the, 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 the standard right. brews that we all love. Mm -hmm. um, but the competition kind of makes you think about, well, let's try something new, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. New, new, new yeast strains. Um, the soft, new, modern IPA is much different than, than our regular West Coast. We kind of like to think that we had the original Northwest style IPA, which was um, very well balanced with malt and hop flavors. It's, when we started, it was, you were bringing something into, onto someone's table or into someone's, you know, house or home with a bottle of, and it was, it was such a different flavor. It was like going from Folgers to, to like Starbucks. Right. Or going from Dairy Gold to haagen you know, in the days when those, you know, and you know, that intense flavor that was so much different than a lot of the products that we grew up with, you know, eating and drinking. And so when we first brewed that IPA, you had to have something that was approachable for people. You couldn't just go in and be like, okay, here's an Imperial IPA yeah. or here's this, you know, or here's yeah. a fresh hop that's all, you know, people go like, what the heck is going on? Why is this so bitter? What's, you know, and so these beers started out much more balanced. And then as the, as the public gained knowledge and educated their palate about what was happening, then these other things can go on, like the sour beers and the fruit beers and mm. coffee beers. Mm -hmm. But so going from like our, our West Coast IPA, which still has a, has a cult following, and our Scotch Ale, those beers were based on the culture at the time that needed balance and approachability, and then we could you know, lift off from there and launch from there. Like an entry level. Exactly. Some might call, yeah. call gateway. Gateway, yeah, yeah. And yeah. you know, but they still, some people have stuck with the Scotch Ale oh, forever, so you good. know? And they, it's like adult Kool-Aid, it's know? so good. Yeah, it definitely <laughs> has a cult following. Yeah. 
And so those beers are still in our, um, in our repertoire, but we've branched off to do um, sour beers and fruit beers and fresh hop beers and, you know. Any yeah. big, just hazy flops, beers. Like, oh, we shouldn't have, oh, that was just awful. Oh. Well, we did not do well with our barrel program. We did not do well with our barrel program. We had, um, it really needs a focused brewer to handle it. It's like its own, it's its own program. Sure. And um, whole different process. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot. Yes. Yeah. And um, so we we started out. We had a brewer that was focused on that, and we did have some early on successes. But after he left, we just never went and had the, you know, just didn't find the person to have that experience to fill that space. So we've got the barrels. We may may um, you know revisit that. But yeah, that was that was disappointing. It was disappointing. Yeah. Well, to counter that disappointment, huh, countless awards mm -hmm. for your product mm -hmm. products yeah. over the years A absolutely countless not only for the beer itself but best small business from the chamber of commerce mm -hmm. you won that one year most philanthropic small business yeah. in washington state yeah in the whole state and um largest brew pub in the country mm -hmm. three out of the last six years mm -hmm. how does that make you feel it's pretty it's just almost <laughs> unbelievable you know it's just the the largest brew pub in the country is it's based on you have to sell 25% of what you brew at your on premise so there's large huge brew pubs that sell a lot more of their beer you know so much beer off premise that they can't meet that criteria so just so you know that to kind of qualify what that means because people go like well i've been to you know a red hook brewery and they're yeah. a lot bigger than boundary bay so there but there is a qualification that you meet and but it's still highly competitive and there's like i said there's thousands of these in the country and it feels good i mean it feels good to have been able to provide consistent service and quality food um, to people for this many years, you know, 19, since 1995, be bringing people in and people coming back. Restaurants, I was on the board of um, the Washington Restaurant Association, and you know, it's the, the stats on successes in restaurants is, yeah. is bleak. It's very, very hard, and it takes a lot of hard work. So you, there's, yeah, I'm proud of I'm proud of the staff that's been able to to provide for our customers and our guests all these years. Well, you know, Starbucks was really big into the third place, uh -huh. right? Right. And I like to think of Boundary Bay as the original third place mm -hmm. for Bellingham. Yeah. You really did kind of curate the community gathering spot. Mm -hmm. uh, was that intentional, or did that just kind of happen? Well, as a I mean, operating a pub. It, you know, that is the vibe that you want. You want people to come together and chat and just kind of like, and Ed always referred to the Cheers, you know, that, yeah. that TV show. Norm. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. just have your, have your regulars. And so once you got that regular base, then it really gets that home feeling because you, you'll see them. You come in, they'll come in the door, and they'll look. Some bartenders will have the beer on the <laughs> on the bar for for the people, you know, before they even get to the bar. Yeah. So that once you get that kind of like prime it with that that familiarity and and that feeling of of third place or or your second home or whatever you want to call it, it's then it really starts to roll mm -hmm. and seeing kids grow up in the in the brewery has just been just a, such a blessing we have we have now we have staff that work for us that their parents work for us <laughs> and you know it's just you know just seeing little ones in a basket you know off to being cheerleaders at sea home it's so great wow yeah something else i found written about you and this is a quote i'm sorry i can't i don't know who wrote this um but it says if you glimpse into the soul of Boundary Bay, you'll find Janet Leitner filled with nothing but peace <laughs> and love for Bellingham. How beautiful. <laughs> is, is that? I, I wonder who did say that. <laughs> why, wow. why do you think they're saying that? Um, well, one thing I think is, I wonder if it's somebody who actually has worked at the brewery or knows, you know, or was interviewed at the brewery because any memo that I write to staff I sign peace and love, you know, with my with my initials. So 
that is my signature line. I talk about that as being my signature line. And I, I was a philosophy student in college. And actually, little known fact, I dabbled in, I considered being a nun. Oh. And so I did, I studied a lot of religion and I, and, um, but throughout that, just to find the good in people and was really what drove home, what was driven home to me in conversations and literature and just that, you know, just a capacity to love. And, yeah. yeah. And I think it's okay to, to talk about love. I think it's okay to love and care about my staff. And I, you know, I, Mama J. you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's okay. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's, it's better than okay. <laughs> it's better than okay. You've also been known to say there's a spirit in Bellingham mm -hmm. you don't find anywhere else. And you travel quite a bit. Yeah. So for you to say yeah. that, it, you, you say it's always nice to come home. I yeah. love traveling, but to yeah. come home to Bellingham, what, what do you think makes Bellingham so special? Well, for me, it's definitely, you know, my family in Boundary Bay. Um, but even when I came for college, there was just this 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 vibe that um, of acceptance for you know for others uh, the the feeling of welcome welcoming all is you know has always been a a truth for me with Bellingham mm -hmm. that we feel like we're we're accepting of of others and you know, I, I really thrive in an environment like that um, I miss Bellingham when I'm away I I do love to travel and. And but when I get into another city, I often find myself peeking in a restaurant or especially in a brew pub. And you know, if I've been gone for you know over a week or two, it's like I miss being a part of that whole that mm -hmm. machine. And you know, you see it when it's clicking and it's working, and you know that everybody back there is their hearts are singing because they're a part of something that's bigger than themselves. Yeah, yeah. Public service has also been really important to you. Mm -hmm. um, You've served on the board. You mentioned the Washington Restaurant Association, mm -hmm. also the Wacom Dispute Resolution Center, Sustainable Connections, and you're the founding board member of something called Shifting Gears. Mm -hmm. What is that? Shifting Gears is a is a new new nonprofit that we focus on breaking down barriers for women to be able to get out into the outdoors for recreation. Um, try to you know. For women, being alone outside can be intimidating, and some people may not grow up in a household where you know there's a lot of outdoor recreation. But in, in Bellingham, there's so many opportunities for recreation, whether it's just uh, you know hiking, walking, biking, kayaking. Yeah. I mean, just you name it, right? And I think it's empowering for women to be able to get outside and you know learn that learn how to do these things. Um, being outdoors. Is is good for you. Being outdoors is 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 healthy for you know. It can help with depression. It can help with um, self-image. It can so help with so many you know ailments that people have, whether mental, mental, physical, emotional. Being outdoors is a great cure. And to think that women are fearful of getting outdoors by themselves um, is upsetting. And so this group is breaking down barriers and, and gently taking people out and, you know, and showing them that, that it's safe and, and do things at different skill levels. And it's, it's been, it's a slow, it's slow going. Funding is, funding is hard. Shifting gears. <laughs> Check it out, people. We yeah. can, what you know, shiftinggears.org. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I always thought for me doing something adventurous, if I had the right gear, and the right mm -hmm. guide, uh -huh. then I can almost do anything. Right. So maybe shifting gears can get you in touch with it, those people. Yeah, if, and we yeah. provide gear for yeah. for hiking. We provide bicycles. We're working with middle schools. Oh, that's with, wonderful. Yeah, just it's really starting to gain momentum. And yeah, I'm super proud of the, the founders and to be on the founding board with them has just been a real blessing. Another feather in your cap, or ah. shamrock, <laughs> we should say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you founded the Bellingham St. Patrick's Day Parade. What a fun event. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah, that is so fun. It's, that is, to me, well, we had such a, such a turnout for St. Patrick's Day at Boundary sure. for years and years and years. And I saw part of the community on St. Patrick's Day that I didn't see the rest of the year. I thought, these, 
these people love this holiday. They're not our regulars, but boy, do they come out. And I, thought, I think we could grow this thing. I think we're bursting at the seams. People are lining down the street to get in here. Why don't we, why don't we open it up to the community for a celebration and, and see what happens? So we, um, we did that, and it's turned into a bit of like a, a rite of passage throughout wintertime. You know, people have been kind of hunkered down, yep. and it's like, okay, it's, it's, the, it's parade day. Let's get the kids out, rain or shine. We're going outside, and, you know, let's get outside and enjoy our community together again. And it's, it's so fun to see the when, truly rain or shine. I mean, if it's raining, I know where the people are going to hunker down and watch the parade. And if it's sunny, I know where they're going to try to catch the most sun. And it's, um, yeah, it's just been a really, a, just a, a big, big fun time for me. But yeah. it, there's also a ser serious side to it. It calls attention to yeah. the local yeah. rescue workers, correct? Yes, yes, our public safety personnel. Yeah. Yeah, I read today, um, I think it was, uh, I think it was in Asheville, North Carolina, they call them, their local heroes. Oh. And they included teachers and um Teachers, nurses, um, police officers, law enforcement. I just thought that was just such a neat thing, our local heroes. Yeah. So, yes, we're definitely um, focusing on our public safety personnel. That's great. And yeah. the, and just the, the parade always happens on the Saturday before St. Patrick's, Patrick's, Patrick's Day. Patrick's Unless St. Patrick's Day is on Saturday, then great party on. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, for fun, you like to travel mm -hmm. quite a bit. Right. Yeah. Yes. And recently, well, a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. you went to Everest. I did. Talk yeah. about that. It's an I, amazing um, experience. Yes, it was. I, I had um, backstory for that trip was I had lost my son. I did. I lost my son to the op opioid crisis, and I didn't. I just it was devastating. And um, this trip to Everest came just came into my life and it was a small group it was a women's group that were going and I didn't even think of, I didn't really think I just said I'm doing this I just I, I want to do this and it was so healing and it's it's, it's um it's a beautiful it's the the Himalayas are just mystical. I mean, it's it just in itself is is full of mystery, and the Tibetan spirit lives strong in the Himalayas. And I also extended that trip, and I went to Bhutan before I went to Everest. So there were a lot of monasteries, and having shared my study of religion with you, it was very meaningful and powerful for me to be in these monasteries and um, combined with that natural beauty and the group of women that I was traveling with, it was, it was all such good medicine for my broken heart. Mm. And um, so, it, so I started to train and it's, it's um, hiking to Everest Base Camp is, is doable. The, the, the altitude is really the biggest the biggest fight you're going to have. Um, it, it tires you out and it created an insomnia with me, but I still keep in touch with the guides that I, that were with me on that trip. Um, the women supported me and let me have all the privacy, all the quiet time I wanted. Um, still, still dear friends, still keep in touch. It was, um, uh, I, I can just take myself there any at any moment. Mm. I can I can just close my eyes and and be there. And you know we had um, had ceremony for my son with um, with one of my guides, and it's just it was something so special and dear. And I um, yeah I'm not the same person that I was when I got on that plane that I am that I was that I am now. I just it gave me. Yeah, it gave me so much. That mountain gave me so much. Well, opportunities come into our life for yeah. a reason, mm -hmm. at the right time, yeah. for a reason. And yeah. the fact that you were like, yeah, that's for me. I'm going to go. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and supported by Ed, and he's just like, I'm like, how yeah. about that? I'm, I'm going, I'm going to, I'm going to Nepal. He's like, 
<laughs> okay, okay, see you when you get back. Okay. <laughs> wow. Yeah. What and then that? I flew right home to Spokane afterwards. You did? Yeah, that wow. was that was my route. I came um yeah, I flew um flew to Spokane and it's all so magical. But it was um Thanksgiving was so I started the trek on my father's birthday. I flew on my father's birthday October twenty fourth and then Thanksgiving was around um, November 28th that year. And then Zach, my son's birthday, is the 29th of November. So, he's, wow. you know, so it's just this, you know, and so then I came home knowing that that was the first birthday without him. But Ed was there, my daughter was there, my parents were there, you know, my sister. So it was, wow. you know, it just... And none of that went, none of, and I said, add to cart. <laughs> <laughs> add to cart. <laughs> I didn't, none of that was there, right? But it all just, yeah, it was all pretty much meant, meant to be as far as, you know, the people and the places and the folks that I met. And, and, and out yeah. of that, that awful tragedy, mm -hmm. this beautiful experience yeah. with, and, and ending with, the culmination of all of your family being together. I yeah. can't imagine yeah. how wonderful yeah. and therapeutic that was yeah. for you. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. What's Thanks. next for you, Janet? What's next? Any uh, big trips or for Boundary uh, Bay? Ireland is really calling. I Ireland. Ireland. Okay. Yeah. I really, um, yeah, Ireland is definitely, I'm dabbling with a, with a long trip in Ireland. Robert Blake, who is one of our local um, singer songwriters, folk singers here in Bellingham, he tours um, Ireland quite often. And Ed and I have always joked that we want to go to Ireland and just carry his bags and, you know, but just to wander <laughs> right. into an Irish pub and see Robert singing in there and joining in for a pint and maybe, maybe get some bicycles and cycle around Ireland. It's, that has a lot of intrigue and interest for me. So that would be a big trip. Yeah. And recently I fell in love with Asheville, North Carolina. It's um, Beer, Beer, Beer City, USA. There's, it's a size, a little bit bigger city than Bellingham, not that much bigger. 26 breweries, and they're thriving. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Because I, I thought for sure that Bellingham was like, it's, it's yeah. up there though, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like breweries per capita right. or whatever. Yeah. yeah. We're definitely top 10 in the country, wouldn't you say? For our size? I would think so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for our size, definitely, yeah. What's next for Boundary Bay? Just oh, to keep going, keep Yeah, evolving? I think we're, we're coming to some crossroads. I mean, we've been, we've been in um, that location for, well, it'll be 25 years coming around 2020. And so we, um, we do not own that property, so that's a leased that's leased, all of that. So we lease about a half a block now. Yeah. Started out 5,000 square feet, one floor, and then second floor, next door, downstairs. We have these funny <laughs> names for things. It's like, oh, that's next door downstairs or next door upstairs, or that's an 1105. <laughs> and new employees are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but so we've just, you know, taken over bits and bits and bits of it. So we'll see if, um, if we... You know, the, there is a lease extension or opportunity to buy it, or if we'll, you know, evolve into a different sort of brewery somewhere. It's there's a little bit, you know, there's a, some transition time for Ed and I to talk about. And mm -hmm. so I'm in my 60s, and we're getting older, and the kids are there and very capable, and staff is very capable. So it's time to start talking, tr you know, transitions, mm -hmm. you know, tr strategy, and yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for everything you've done oh, for Bellingham yeah. oh, and your community service, your, your public service experience. Just, it's, it's just so lovely to talk to you and to thank you in person for everything that you've given our community. Well, so. right back at you, Deb. Well, yeah. this is about you, Janet. <laughs> it's all about you. Thank you so much. Janet Leitner, Boundary Bay Brewery and beyond today on Bellingham Voices. We'll see you next time.